okay so uh, we uh, we continue the course on combinatorics uh, where we were discussing uh, probabilistic method uh, in particular uh, linearity of expectation so now uh, we look at a couple of examples further so uh, suppose we have a family of uh, subsets of a finite set let's say so you have a set uh, let's say v and uh, this set uh, is the universe and then you make uh, uh, you know, a family of sets drawing elements from this universe now uh, such a collection of uh, you know uh, uh, sets from this universe is called a, a hypergraph so it's basically a, a you know set system and uh, we call uh, such such uh, finite uh, set systems as uh, hypergraphs uh, over the uh, set v now <coughs> the elements of this uh, family right or members of this family right uh, are called the hyper edges uh, of the hypergraph so you know this this is just a fancy terminology right uh, you know uh, hypergraph uh, has really not much to do with graphs but again you know uh, seeing them as hypergraphs sometimes help them you know help us visualize uh, some uh, some kind of properties and uh, when when the uh, uh, sets that we are considering reduces to two element subsets uh, you know hypergraphs becomes uh, graphs now here is an example uh, of a hypergraph over the set uh, 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and 8 uh, 8 9 and uh, here we have the uh, the families so under this green circles uh, so this circle uh, says that you know this edge the hyper edge contains the elements 1 2 and 3 right so this is the set then you have this hyper edge which contains 5 4 3 and 6 right then there is this hyper edge which contains 6 and 7 there is one hyper edge which contains only 7 uh, uh, there is one hyper edge containing only 8 one containing 4 and 9 uh, etc right so this, this is our uh, uh, hypergraph right and uh, you can uh, uh, see this basically a, a, a family of sets uh defined over a finite set <clears throat> now if all the edges contain the same number of elements then we say it's a k uniform hypergraph if if the the cardinality of each uh, uh, edge set is or each each uh, fam, you know uh, each set in the family has the same cardinality k then we say we have a k hypergraph a uh, k uniform hypergraph now Uh, when 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 the hypergraph is two uniform it is just a graph right and uh, when it is three uniform we have like an example here right uh, it's called a three uniform hypergraph where all the edges have exactly three vertices right this one this one has three this has three this has three this has three and this has three so you have a, uh, you have a three uniform hypergraph here, okay so uh, hypergraphs are nothing but uh finite uh, set systems uh and uh, when they uh, they have the same cardinality right the the family elements of the family are the same cardinality then uh, they are called uh k uniform for some k now we want to look at uh coloring the vertices right or the elements of v uh with just two colors okay now we say that a hypergraph on v is uh, two colorable right so i can always two color the uh, elements of v but then when we are looking at uh, you know a particular hypergraph we want to also see whether any edge uh, see only one color right we don't want uh, that to happen for example in the in the case of uh, if you remember in the case of uh, graph coloring what we said is that uh you know end points of an edge c is different colors right if u is an edge then u and v must see you know they should not get the same color here what we are saying is that 
you know if uh, an edge contain several vertices right then each of them uh, need not be different but at least two of them will be different right in in the so if you look in the graph of graph uh, what we are saying is that an edge should say at least two different values right so you want uh, you know the chromatic number of a graph with the minimum number of colors such that uh, every vertex is map to one of these colors and uh, adjacent vertices does not get the same color which means that every edge uh, is uh, not monochromatic right so no edge is monochromatic that uh, if i take any edge it sees at least two colors so if you carry that concept uh, towards hypergraph you can say that a hypergraph is too colorable uh, if elements of b can be colored by red or blue such that none of the hypergraphs is monochromatic okay so here is a, here is a, an example of a hypergraph which i have uh, two colored right so i have i have this uh, uh, vertices right which are the elements of b which i have colored with just two colors red and blue right now if i take any of these edges for example this edge right it has three vertices and uh, it sees two different colors right this edge also sees two different colors this edge also sees two this one also sees two so here i have a two coloring of the uh, uh, this hypergraph now one can ask uh, you know like questions like uh, when uh, hypergraph admits a uh, total thing right what conditions you can say right I mean, can you put some conditions on the number of uh, elements or you know the uh, intersection or something so that uh, or, or relation between the you know like if you are looking into uniform hypergraphs right if you have a k uniform hypergraph k and the number of vertices some relations which will tell us that okay if such a relation is true then we can always find a total something like that. is that possible so we want to look at such questions so uh, erdos uh, paul erdos uh, proved that every k uniform hypergraph with less than 2 raised to k minus 1 hyper edges is two color so the hypergraph is k uniform it means that every edge right every member of the family of sets right Uh, every 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 set in the family has exactly k elements right now if you are given a, a such a family and say that you know it is k uniform and the number of edges that is given is uh, strictly less than 2 power k minus 1 now the claim is that this hypergraph is two color but no matter how you are going to decide the edges right so you have this you know uh, vertices and then uh, you are looking at uh, k uniform hypergraphs now whatever way you want to put if you have only uh, at, um, if you have at most two raised to k minus 1 uh, edges right then uh, you can always two color the uh, family so that is the claim <clears throat> now how do you prove this so again if you to recall your uh, uh let's like say so far we are going to basically first define a random experiment and then show that uh, such a coloring so since we want to show existence of coloring right the objects that we are going to say appears with positive probability are the uh, good colorings right two colorings which are good so therefore uh, we want to look at all possible two coloring for example that is a random experiment so let us come up with a two coloring of the hypergraph so how do you do that well you you first uh, take your hypergraph and then pick every vertex uh, and color it with uh, one of the two colors red or blue right where each color is uh, having the same probability equally likely so what is, there are only two so because it is uniform right one over two is the probability for red to be given to the vertex and 1 over 2 is the probability that blue is also given to the vertex so we color all the vertices independently like this so you take the first vertex toss a coin heads color it red blue color it uh, i mean uh, tails color it blue right so now uh, you repeat this for the second vertex you again toss a coin right? so 
all these are independent so therefore uh, you can uh, you can look at the <coughs> uh, look at the colorings the, you know the outcomes which are the two colorings of the graph and and, and uh, uh, study their property now <coughs> suppose you are given uh, you know an edge uh, of the hypergraph right so if there is an edge e you want to see what happened to this edge under the coloring that we are considering right so we are looking at two colorings random two colorings and you know considering a random two coloring we want to see what happened to a particular edge so if all the vertices in this edge becomes uh, you know monochromatic that they all get the red color or they all get the blue color then there is a problem right so let us see what is the probability that this happens for that uh, we define an indicator random variable called x x sigma uh, x uh, e right which is the random variable which says that the event e becomes one of uh, the edge e uh, sorry I, i have written event so it is the edge uh, so the edge becomes the edge g becomes monochromatic right now <clears throat> so uh, if if you have uh, uh, this happening right what is the probability of this so probability that uh, the edge becomes uh, monochromatic right is the probability that x uh, e is equal to 1 right because x e is the indicator random variable it takes the value 1 whenever that becomes monochromatic right okay? so probability of xc is equal to 1 is uh, 2 into 1 over 2 raised to k because you have k vertices each of them has probability half to become color red right and uh, if one of them is colored red then to become monochromatic all the remaining must also be colored red. so what is the probability that all the k vertices get the same color which is red 1 by 2 into 1 by 2 into etc 1 by 2 k times right so 1 by 2 raised to k now this is 2 raised to k uh, be more clearly written so 1 by 2 raised to k right now <coughs> then uh, we know that that is the probability that it becomes red similarly it can also become blue right so it's the same probability therefore uh, you have 2 times 1 over 2 raised to k so the probability that the edge becomes monochromatic is uh, 2 uh, raised to 1 minus k or 1 by 2 raised to k minus 1 right so this is the probability that an edge becomes monochromatic now what i want to do is that i want to count the monochromatic edges in the graph so because the indicator random variable says whenever an edge becomes monochromatic if i sum over all the edges x e right uh that will tell you you know in the random experiment whenever x has become uh, i mean the edge uh, e has become monochromatic it will add one right so for every edge if it is monochromatic it will add one so basically this summation will tell you the number of monochromatic edges right so x uh, here is uh, the summation over all uh, uh, edges x e and that counts the monochromatic edges in the graph now <clears throat> well so we have this now we we'll let us look at the expectation right so what is the expectation of the random variable x right what is the expected number of monochromatic edges the expectation of x is summation over all the edges expectation of x e because of the linearity of expectation right because uh, x is the sum so expectation of x is the sum of the expectations right so by linearity of expectation we can write this so expectation of x is equal to summation expectation of x e but x e is a indicator random variable and for indicator random variables the probability that uh, it becomes 1 is actually equal to the expectation of so therefore that is equal to uh, equal to 2 raised to uh, 1 minus k right for expectation of x e so summation over all uh, e uh, 2 raised to 1 minus k now because every edge has precisely this uh, expectation 
right? We can just multiply, right? Uh, by the number of edges, which is the number of edges into 2 raised to 1 minus 5. But the condition in our theorem, right? At our statement says that the graph was strictly less than 2 raised to k minus 1 hyper edges, right? So therefore, uh, the cardinality of head set of H is strictly less than 2 raised to k minus 1. So the product of something strictly less than 2 raised to k minus 1 into 2 raised to 1 minus k is less than 1. So the expectation of x is strictly less than 1. Now if the expected number is strictly less than 1, then uh, which says that at least for 1, right, at least for 1 uh, coloring, uh, you know, x should take the value 0, right, because if it is 1 for, uh, 1 or more for everything, right, then uh, the expectation also will be larger than. So therefore, uh, for some coloring, expectation of x is uh, less than, right, I mean, uh, 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 expectation of x is less than 1, for, therefore, some color, for some coloring, x will be strictly less than 1, which means that it is only 0, because x is a counting variable, it can only take value 0. So therefore, there is a two coloring of the hypergraph, right. So we, we just uh, uh, use the linear type expectation here, right, and uh, we proved that the uh, uniform hypergraph on, uh, uh, k uniform hypergraph on any number of uh, vertices, where the number of hyper edges is limited is uh, always two color, right? Is limited by two raised to k minus one is always uh, two color. <coughs> now, uh, we will look at one more uh, question. Uh, this is about uh, some free sets. So, given uh, a subset of an additive group. So we are looking at additive groups. Uh, let us say that uh, a subset is uh, sum free if adding two elements of this subset, uh, you get elements always outside the uh, subset. So you take any two elements and add them, you are going to get an element which is not in the set. Then it's the sum free because the sum of two elements are not in the set. So, if x plus y is not an uh, element of b for every x and y, right, uh, in b, then b is a uh, sum free subset of the, uh, uh, the group that we are looking at. Now, <clears throat> there are uh, very nice examples that we can see, like if you take set of all odd integers, right, it is a sum free uh, subset of your uh, set of all uh, the integers, right? So, right, the integers with the usual addition, right? So, you take set of all integers with the usual addition, set of all odd integers uh, is some free because if you add any two odd integers, you are going to get uh, an even, right? So, it is not in the set. Uh, if you look at finite sets, for example, right, n plus 1, n plus 2, etc., 2n. Uh, is a subset of uh, 1 to 2n, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and you and can look at the uh, addition modulo uh, 2n, right? And then in this uh, set, uh, in this uh, group, this subset is also something, right? So if you add any of these two, you are going to get something less than, uh, less than this. Uh, which, is, which is not in this, right? So you, you are going to get. Uh, now, <clears throat> now uh, so the question is that suppose you are given an arbitrary set, okay? See, when, when you have like, uh, you know, sets like set of all integers, etc., you are able to find uh, infinitely large sum free subsets. But uh, now, suppose I give you an arbitrary uh, set of numbers, right, instead of a, instead of a, instead of a group, right, uh, I, I give you an arbitrary set of numbers. Now, like, so this set of numbers is, you can assume that, you know, they are basically uh, within the, within uh, the set of all integers, right? So you are looking at uh, uh, 
integers out of this we are giving some arbitrary subset not consecutive or nothing like that now can you find a, a large enough uh, some free subsets for this set? so uh, you know like so basically uh, you know you know like so so if you are you know two two people are saying that one you know one say that i can find very large uh, subset but the other guy is able to choose whichever uh, numbers that he want to give to the person to make the initial set right so which means that like you know we can choose the element so that like you know it uh, you know it it uh, it has very less chances of becoming uh, some free or like you know you, you can you know you can you can create uh, you know uh, sets by taking elements and adding the element um, and finding out you know the number that you get add that to the set etc etc right you can do this kind of thing now given all these things can you guarantee that you can always find a uh, larger sub uh, some free subset it turns out that given uh, any subset right uh, of integers right let's say that a is uh, a set of uh, non zero uh, integers suppose there are n of them right for some n right then you can always find a uh, some free subset uh, b of a where the cardinality of b is strictly greater than n over 3 okay so more than a third of the uh, elements can always be chosen so that they becomes uh, some free no matter how you are going to give me the numbers at least one third of the set i can uh, make some free so this is the result of uh, erdos but uh, i want you to take it uh, as a homework and prove it and you can use one of the tools that we studied uh, before <coughs> now here is another question Uh, for that uh, let us define the independent number of a graph so we already said what is uh, an independent set right so an independent set in a graph is a set of uh, vertices where uh, within the graph between these vertices there is no edge present right so if you look at the induced subgraph on these vertices uh, you will get a, an empty uh, graph right where without any edges now if you look at the largest uh independent set that you can find in a graph it is called the independent number is usually denoted by alpha of g okay so alpha of g is the independent number which is the maximum size of an independent set in the graph now uh a homer question uh, uh, as you to show that if uh, given a graph on n vertices and uh, for each vertex uh, let us say uh, i the degree is given by di now uh show that the independent number of the graph g is greater than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n 1 by uh, di plus 1 okay so this is di so alpha of g is greater than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n 1 by di plus 1. now this is a nice uh, question and uh, i would say that it's reasonably difficult Uh, but uh, you should uh, give it a serious try okay <coughs> okay so that is enough uh, you know uh, examples from uh, you know the basic uh, uh, tools and uh, uh, what you call the <coughs> linear type expectation etc now we we will uh, skip you know things like uh, second moment methods like you know applications of variance and things like that uh, for uh, you know for a more advanced course but uh, i want to uh, tell you about a very powerful tool uh, <clears throat> which is called uh, lovas local lemma okay so we will we will we'll look at a general form of this but before that we we want to state a simpler form which uh, is called a symmetric uh, lovas local lemma so what is the idea of uh, lovas local lemma okay. so it's called a sieve of lovas so sieve is something that helps you to filter out only the things that you want right and 
ரோய வேதரை மேனே one of the major difficulties uh, that we face when we try to use uh, tools from probability theory is that uh, you know when when events are uh, events are not not uh, independent mutually independent then uh, then we have uh, you know we have trouble in uh, in bounding uh, you know like uh, probability of uh, a union etc or to find the dependency etc uh, will be kind of uh, uh, difficult okay and then applying the tool um, many of the tools will become kind of difficult so only you know very few tools are there which uh, does not worry about the uh, about the depend uh, you know mutual uh, dependence of events for example uh, linearity of expectation right it doesn't matter but then you know linearity of expectation itself has uh, its own limit right i know it, it is very universally applicable but uh, its power is much limited now if you want to look at for further advanced tools uh, many times you we face this problem with uh, dependence uh, between events now how to how to take care of this uh, you know it's uh, not always easy so one of the interesting tools that was uh, you know uh, that was proved by uh, lovas was uh, his uh, his lemma which was a very small lemma when he proved it right and he used it to prove something very specific and this lemma basically allows uh, to say that okay see you might have you know you might have uh, uh, many many events and the events might have dependencies but as far as you can say that you know for an event you can always find a small enough uh, local uh, uh, subset of other events on which this event can influence right uh, right uh, basically the events can uh, depend on this uh, event what happens to this uh, event if that is local enough right so local in the sense that like you know so if you are looking at for example like graph and to, talking about you know coloring you can say that you know i vertex then you know its neighborhood or second neighborhood you know this can be like you know some some finite uh, uh, length right for some small number fixed number that many neighborhood you can go and say that everything within this i will say as local right so something like that right so you want to say that okay for every event you can find a subset of events which we call uh, you know uh, the events which uh, this event can influence or like you know it's which may not be uh, independent uh, with uh, this event that subset of events is uh, local and it's small if i can guarantee that then under some uh, conditions you can guarantee you know uh, certain thing uh, does not happen right so so you want to show that you know like for example your idea is to show that uh, you have a set of uh, events right which are bad events right? i don't want these events to happen and if this event does not happen then i can say that something good happens right right or i can say that some a good uh, combinatorial structure exists now to come up with such a uh, such a result i my idea is to define certain events which are bad events such that these bad events right uh, if none of these bad events happen together then my my case is good right so to show this i can use lovas local lemma for example if i can say that okay each event depends on at most you know uh, some uh, small enough subset of uh, uh, all the events and for every event i can find such sets and we can bound all these things by something then Uh, under some conditions lovas local lemma guarantees that none of the events happen with positive probability right? that tells you that such a structure must exist because we are saying that you know like probability of things going bad is strictly less than 1 right therefore things going good has non zero probability okay so without further ado uh, let me proceed so here is the simpler version which is called a symmetric lovas local lemma now what is its state right suppose you have events a1 a2 etc an where probability of each event can be upper bounded by a number p 
Okay, so P is a uh, number between uh, 0 and 1 and probability of AI is always upper mode P. Every event AI. Okay. This N can be very, very, very large. Doesn't matter. Now, for each event, right, you say that at most D other events uh, can influence, I mean, can be influenced by the occurrence of this. Event, okay. Which means that for every other event other than this D, right, you look at all events, right, A1 to AN, and uh, from this set, this A1 to AN minus, you know, this small set of D, all these other events, right, are going to be mutually independent of the event AI, right. For every event AI, you can find some subset where, you know, this guy depends on at most D other events, right, for each event AI. Then, if E times P times D plus 1, Right, so E is the uh, base of natural logarithm, you know, which is uh, small e, and P is the probability that we said is bounding all the events probability, and D is the dependence, right? Uh, that uh, at most D other events can depend on AI, right, for every AI. Then E into P into D plus one. If that is strictly less than one, then the lowest local lemma says that uh, uh, none of the events AI occur together, right? None of them occur with positive probability, right? So, what, what we are saying is that probability of AI, uh, I mean, A1 intersection A2, in, I mean, A1 bar intersection A2 bar, etc., A n bar, right? That these events, none of these events happen together with uh, positive probability. Which means that there is some, so if, if I can define my events A1 to A n, such that if A1 to A n does not occur, then uh, something good happen, right? Like my graph has a good coloring, or uh, I can find a, uh, you know, a subgraph uh, which is uh, monochromatic or not monochromatic, right? Something like that. So these kind of things. <clears throat> now, let us look at an example of this. So, uh, so this Lovas local lemma, as I, as I mentioned before, this was a very small result in Lovas' first paper, and uh, you know it it was not really uh, you know thought of as a breakthrough result or anything. Now, on the other hand, when uh, Erdot right, so Erdot uh, saw this result, right, heard about this result, he immediately realizes it is very 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 powerful compared to. You know, uh, the tools that we have so far. So he basically made use of this tool left, right and center. Like, you know, he, he started proving many, many results that were not possible to prove, uh, you know, uh, till then using this uh, tools uh, with the help of Lovash and, you know, uh, other collaborators. And he made it so popular. He, he realized the potential of this and, you know, like said that, okay, this is not just a simple lemma. It's a very powerful tool and let us make use of it. And uh, uh, you can see now, like you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers uh, written where you know they use uh, Lovas local lemma as one of the main rules. Now, <clears throat> here is one of the results that we want to look at today. So, so this is uh, proved by Edwards and Lovas. So this basically, uh, you know. Uh, you know, like tries to prove something similar to what we did in the previous example that uh, if uh, yeah, you are given a, a hypergraph, right, k on from hypergraph, and you want to talk about uh, two colorability of this. Now, the problem with the earlier result that we had was that it depends or, or it puts a very serious restriction on the number of edges the hypergraph can have, right? When you are saying that you are looking at k on from hypergraph. But now the graph can only contain at most two raised to k minus, and otherwise it doesn't tell you how to or whether we can color the graph with two colors or not. Now, uh, here is a result which uh, does not put any restriction on the number of edges we can. It says that you can have as many number of edges as you want. Only thing is that you say that okay, if you take one edge. 
it does not intersect too many other edges. Like for example, if I have uh, a k-uniform hypergraph where uh, at most two raised to k minus three other edges uh, can uh, intersect with one edge, right? The, the earlier proof was that, that our graph does not contain more than 2 raised to k minus 1. We are saying that now one edge is allowed to intersect with 2 raised to k minus 3 other edges. I mean, it cannot be more than that, but at, up to 2 raised to k minus 3 edges, it can intersect also. And you can have as many edges as you want. Even then, I can say h is two color. So, <clears throat> let us try to see uh, how we can use lowest local lemma to prove this. So again, we start with a random experiment, right? Uh, HBA K uniform hypergraph on uh, V and uh, E1 to EM be its hyper edges. Okay? So like we will assume that there are M hyper edges and uh, uh, it's a uniform K uniform hypergraph on set V. Now we are going to two color the elements of V uniformly and independently random with two colors, our red and blue. And then we are going to define our bad events, right? See, what is a bad event for us, right? So, for us, a bad event is that a hyper edge becomes monochromatic, right? So, so AI is the event that the edge EI becomes monochromatic. So, you have M edges, right? So, you have M events, right? Each edge I say that, okay, it becomes monochromatic. What is the probability of AI? Probability of AI is actually equal to uh, 2 into 1 by 2 raised to cardinality of EI because cardinality of EI is our uh, our uh, k, right? Because uh, we are looking at k uniform hyperedges. So, if uh, the edge EI has uh, k, uh, k vertices, then each vertex uh, can be independently colored with red or blue. So, as we saw in the previous example, Right, 1 by 2 raised to number of vertices, which is 1 by 2 raised to cardinality of EI. That is the probability that it becomes monochromatic with one of the fixed colors. There are two colors, red and blue. So therefore, two times this is the probability that this happens, which is 2 raised to 1 minus k. Right? So, probability of AI is 2 raised to 1 minus k. Now, <coughs> so probability of AI we got, right? So, uh, to apply this, we want upper bound for the probabilities, but now we know that it is actually equal to uh, P equal to rest the same. Then uh, we need to find a uh, bound for D, right? So we know what is E, of course, right? And then if you know what is D, then we can apply the lemma. So what is D? So to find D, we want to see, right, when two events are, uh, you know, can be dependent, right? One event can influence other events. See, suppose I look at uh, an event AI, which says that, the edge EI becomes monochromatic, right? All the edges of EI becomes the same color. Now, when can this <coughs> coloring of these vertices affect the uh, another edge, right? Whether it becomes monochromatic or not? Only if the other edge contains some of these vertices. Otherwise, you know, like I have some vertices here, which is part of an edge. I have another edge where you have some other ed uh, vertices. No matter what I color here, it is not going to affect the coloring of the other edge, right? So only when two uh, edges intersect, then we, you know, we know that there is going to be uh, dependency on what coloring the vertices of this edge gets. Right? So therefore, two uh, events A and A J uh, are mutually independent if they don't share any vertex. Now, how many edges? Uh, AI shares, I mean, uh, you know, AI uh, shares uh, with other, I mean, uh, how many vertices? Not how many vertices, how many other events AI can be dependent on? Well, that is precisely uh, less than, uh, uh, what is that, 2 raised to k minus 3 because we know that one edge cannot intersect more than 2 raised to k minus 3 other edge. So we know that D is at most 2 raised to k minus 3. So, the maximum number of events affected by the event AI is at most 2 raised k minus 3. So, therefore, I can apply this uh, rule E, P, D or like, so the, the lemma also says that, you know, we can make it slightly weaker and say that 
for PD less than or equal to 1 is also sufficient. So, so 4 into P into D is 4 into 2 raised to 1 minus K into 2 raised to K minus 3. But, you know, we know that D is less than or equal to this. So, therefore, 4 into PD is less than or equal to this. Right? But this is actually equal to 1. So, therefore, 4 into, 4 into P into D less than or equal to 1. So, by Lovas local lemma, we know that uh, uh, there is positive probability that none of the events AI occur. So, what is an event AI? Some edge becomes monochromatic. If none of the edges become monochromatic, then we have a two coloring. So, therefore, by Lovas local lemma, the two coloring is possible. <coughs> so, this is what uh, a typical application of uh, Lovas local lemma. Right? So, this is a symmetric version where things are very easy. Now we can look at a slightly more uh, general version of the uh, lemma or, or the, in fact, most general version of lemma, which is uh, much more uh, powerful uh, as you can imagine. <coughs> so let us look at the general uh, Lovas local lemma. So I'm going to state the lemma. I will not give the proof, but uh, it's, it's fairly simple actually, but you know, I don't want to uh, do the proof for this course. Uh, this can be done in a uh, course uh, where we discuss these kind of questions uh, in detail. It's right? a more advanced course. So here I will I will I will give you uh, an idea, right? and then uh, you can you can think of how to prove this if you want. And the proof is uh, quite simple. I mean, you know, you just need to work out some details. But, uh, that's it. So <clears throat> what is the general law of uh, local lemma say? So let uh, a1, a2, etc., an, right, the set uh, is called A, be a set of uh, events uh, which are typically uh, bad events. Okay? So bad in the sense that usually, you know, what we want to use uh, Lovas like lemma is to, uh, to, show, to show that, like, you know, certain things does not happen gives us a good color, right? So therefore, uh, since that is the idea, we were typically going to define the events to be bad events that we do, we want to avoid, right, happen. So, A1 to AN uh, be a, a set of uh, events such that each event AI, right, is mutually independent of all events except some subset DI of A. Okay? So, DI is some subset of, again, A1 to AN, right, and uh, for each AI, we can associate a DI, right? So AI, you know, what happens to AI can only affect elements in DI, right? In other A minus DI, you know, they are all mutually independent with AI, right? Any subset of that, whatever happened there is not going to affect AI or AI is not going to affect any of them. Now, suppose you can find a real numbers, right? X1, X2, etc., Xn corresponding to uh, A1 to AI, right? So for each event, now I am also finding some corresponding real numbers, right, uh, in the interval uh, 0, uh, open 1, such that probability of AI is at most Xi times. So Xi is the real number, right? Probability of AI is Xi times. Product over all the events AJ in DI, right? All the dependent events, right? Right, events that... Uh, AI may be dependent on or, you know, that can be affected by AI. So, take those dependent events AJ, right? For each AJ, whatever is AJ, right? AJ is some event in uh, in DI, which is in event to AN. Uh, you have a corresponding, of course, for every, uh, you know, event to AN, I have a corresponding XI. So, there, uh, you know, you have a corresponding X, uh, XJ, right? So, now I take the product 1 minus XJ, for all, all this uh, AJ in DI, which means that the, you know, so one minus, so XJ, uh, you know, XI is a probability, an upper bound for uh, AI. So one minus XJ is going to tell you, right, uh, like, uh, you know, something does not happen, right? So uh, XI, so if this happened, right, so XI is some random, uh, you know, like real numbers and uh, XJs are uh, real numbers, right? So, Xi into 1 minus Xj, product 1 minus Xj, where uh, the product varies overall uh, dependent events. Suppose this happens, right, for every AI. So, you have all the 
a1 to a n this n events n can be very 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 large so for all the events i can show that probability of a is less than or equal to xi into product uh, 1 minus xj then the lowest local lemma guarantees that the probability that uh, ai uh, bar intersection you know like uh, our i ranging from 1 to n uh, is uh, greater than or equal to product i equal to 1 to n 1 minus xi which is uh, a number strictly greater than 0 because i said that xi's are all within the range 0 open and roll bar so xi is never 1 so therefore 1 minus xi is positive so product over 1 minus xi is also positive okay so the <clears throat> this is what the lowest local lemma says right that uh, none of the events ai happen with positive probability if i can show this condition holds true okay <clears throat> now this is what the lemma is about right so the application of lemma is typically as follows okay so we will uh, look at the question we define uh, uh, a certain types of uh, you know like uh, so we, we define a random experiment right so we you know like appropriate random experiment so the random experiment must produce the type of objects that we are looking at if you want to find a good uh, you know like edge coloring then we want to randomly color the edges you want to find tournaments you want to randomly orient the edges you want to find good uh, vertex coloring you want to randomly color the vertices right but the, you know the probability all these can be varied you can decide which one you want to make whether it will be uniform whether it is something else is better right uh, so all that depends on uh, the context but uh, generally we are going to <coughs> first come up with a random experiment right so the random experiment gives rise to several events then we will say okay what all can go wrong when i do the random experiment right for example i am looking at proper coloring of uh, graphs i randomly color the vertices with colors then what can go wrong two adjacent vertices get the same color that can go wrong right right so that is something which can go wrong so i can define an event right for uh, this kind of thing so for every edge i can define the event that the adjacent vertices get the same color is a bad event right so over all the edges we have these events right then we can look at the probability of this then you know when two events are dependent etc so similarly so we define the random experiment then we come up with a set of events so the events are bad events and and they are designed in such a way that when their absence is guaranteed right if none of these events happen then we also get a guarantee that the kind of good coloring that we are looking at or good object that we are looking at exists with positive probability right so then what is the uh, uh, not so exit right if if this is guaranteed then it is also guaranteed now <clears throat> then what are we going to do so once we have this events we want to find upper bounds for the probability right so using the uh, you know tools from the probability theory and then we can work out the details right in the example we find out the uh, probabilities or upper, upper bound for the probabilities right so we want uh, the upper bound for the probabilities right so some numbers here then once you get uh, this uh, probabilities then we are going to come up with some real numbers coming up with the real numbers is not always a direct task of course we can immediately see that because this product is less than 1 since this inequality must be true xa must be an upper bound for p of a right so if it is not an upper bound for p of a this will never go through so therefore xis are going to be larger than p of a now we have to choose xis in a proper manner so that our things work out so this is usually by done by some ideas that we can come with experience some uh, trial and error and uh, usually you know working out the details so come up with this real numbers and then what we do then we look at uh, the events di right i mean you know uh, for every ai we find out what happens to di now can you find out uh, the precise set of uh, uh, di if you cannot find out uh, that then we can still do it by by looking at the uh, the maximum uh, number of events uh, you know uh, this happened and then uh, we can put a bound that will also will help you to do 
and then uh, eventually once you have all these things we substitute in the inequality and then try to work out if uh, this exercise will work you change if it does not work you change it slightly right and then uh, work with this and eventually suppose this uh, identity becomes true then we can say that okay we are good right the law of lo uh, local lemma goes through so this is the uh, the way we we usually apply this so now let us uh, get to business and look at some example so uh, before that uh, i know uh, the proof i am omitting the proof uh, the idea is very simple as i mentioned uh, the probability uh, of i mean you know the, the idea is that you want to first show uh, this result right probability of a given uh, b intersection c is equal to probability of a intersection b given c by probability of b given c this is something very easy to prove suppose you can prove this right once you prove this identity then <coughs> we want to look at probability of ai given intersection aj belonging to s right aj bar right suppose this events aj in s does not happen then you look at the conditional probability now we want to find this conditional probability for every uh, you know uh, possible s that we can come up with so you look at you can do index non cardinality of s and uh, try to prove this identity by you know by using this because you know that you know s can contain many elements here we have only two so we need to use induction right so use now induction on this and uh, you how to apply this identity i think three times to finally come up with a uh form that will reduce to uh, this okay so this you will get uh, by you know like uh, uh by by applying uh, this identity number of times and doing some uh, uh you know some some work here and so that is the that is the general uh, idea but uh, i will not go into the uh, details now an example application okay <clears throat> so this is the only example that we are going to look uh, this uh, is a reasonably detailed example so you will you will get a flavor of whatever uh, uh, that we need to do uh, to come up with a proof <clears throat> so i'm going to define a problem right this was a problem that i defined uh, 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 in my phd uh, work and uh, where i have i have basically Uh, introduce this problem and then prove some results and uh, we are going to look at uh, some <coughs> uh, one of the proofs there uh, and so here uh, here is the here is the problem okay so this uh, this coloring was a generalization of uh, uh, two other uh, colorings that uh, i was studying and then uh, uh, i will not go into those questions at the moment but i am going to define what is intersection as color <coughs> so suppose you are a, uh, you know you are given a graph g and uh, uh, you know you have uh, an edge coloring right uh, is proper which we already looked at right an edge coloring is proper uh, if uh, the color of the incident edges right if e1 and e2 are incident that they have non empty intersection then uh, they are different right uh, so two edges which are incident to each other does not get the same color so that is called a proper edge color <coughs> now uh, if you are using k colors it's called a k coloring okay so if you are using colors from 1 to k then it's a k coloring now <coughs> so what is what is uh, so what is an edge coloring uh, proper edge coloring is that you have two edges right or a number of edges each of the edges incident to a vertex right uh, right uh, it should get a different color right so this color this color and this color and this color must all be uh, be different you cannot give the same color but we can of course uh, give uh, color one here for example because uh, one and one are not uh, incident right so similarly i can give two or three here right? so this is a good uh, proper color right so a proper edge color now for every uh, vertex u right Uh, if you look at uh, c of u as the set of colors used by the edges incident u for example if i look at this vertex let's say x 
then c of x is the set uh, 1, 2, 3 and 4 because 1, 2, 3, 4 are the colors which are appearing on the adjacent set into x. Okay. So, c of x is equal to set 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, <coughs> I call a proper coloring as a k intersection uh, edge coloring, right? If uh, the intersection for any two adjacent uh, CU, CV, right? C, U and V are adjacent, the intersection CU, intersection CV has cardinality at most k. So, what I am saying is that if I if I have this uh, you know uh, this uh, graph and coloring right so I, let, let me look at uh, let's say that uh, this is x and y I look at the edge x y right so if I look at x y what can I say about uh, c of x and c of y right c of x is the set one two three four c of x right and c y is the set 1, 3, and 4, right? So, what is the intersection Cx intersection Cy? It is 1, 3, 4 again. So, Cx intersection Cy cardinality is actually equal to cardinality of 1, 2, 3, uh, 1, 3 4, which is 3, right? So, <coughs> the intersection is 3, right? For this, uh, this edge. Now, we can look at other edges. So, if this edge is not having anything else here, only this. So, therefore, uh, that uh, becomes easier, right? It's uh, it's only one. So you will always be at least one, right? For any adjacent vertices, because the edge uh, in which we are defining this is always part of uh, these two. So therefore, that is fine. <coughs> so if CU intersection CV is less than or equal to K, then we say it's a K intersection edge coloring. If if that is true for every edge, right? So for example, this one is not a two intersection edge coloring because these two adjacent vertices X and Y has an intersection size three. But on the other hand, if I change one of the colors, right, uh, this color to let's say five, right, then it becomes a two intersection coloring because only three and four are common to it, right? Three and uh, four are common to both. So <coughs> when it becomes one, uh, you know, the k is equal to one. What we get is a stronger version called strong edge coloring. We will not go into that. So here we want two conditions, right? One is the coloring is proper, that is mandatory. Second condition is that the intersection uh, CU uh, intersection CV uh, is at most K for any uh, edge UV in the graph. Now, <coughs> such a coloring is called K intersection edge coloring. So here is a, an example of a proper coloring of a complete graph on four vertices. Right, this is a proper coloring, proper edge coloring, and uh, here is a proper coloring, but it is also a two intersection edge coloring. Okay, so here, if I take any edge, you will see that you know, like at most one uh, other color is uh, common to this endpoint, right? For example, here I have white, here also white, and blue is common, right? So, therefore, I have two already. Therefore, this color and this color must be different, right? So I cannot use the same color here and here. And uh, again, this, right? Because this, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, and this are the same. So therefore, uh, you know, this must be different. Now, uh, what about this and this to be the same then? Do I have a problem? Well, you have problem because uh, uh, if I use the same color blue here, now what happens? This is blue, then uh, blue and white uh, and yellow here, blue and white and yellow here. For this edge, there is a problem. So I need to use a different color here also. So uh, this is a two intersection edge coloring. So we can see we need at least five colors here. On the other hand, uh, here I can do with just uh, three colors for a proper edge coloring. So when I put some more condition, I wanted additional edges. So here is another example where CU intersection CV is set one, two, four, right? And uh, so, and you can verify that every edge other edge satisfies this bound, so that puts a three intersection edge color. Now, the so every coloring you can talk about the chromatic number, right, or chromatic index uh, when when you call for edge coloring. 
the or x chromatic number which is the minimum number of collides that will do the job right so chi k of uh, chi k dash of g is the minimum number of collides that admits a proper uh, c intersection uh, k intersection uh, this is k right uh, minimum number of collides k uh, 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 minimum number of collides such that uh, it admits a proper k intersection coloring of the edges of g that is the chi k dash of g so I mean, there is no gap here. Okay, I should uh, I should write it as a k dash of g. <coughs> okay. So we are going to prove the following theorem. Okay. This was a very uh, surprising result and uh, uh, interesting because of that. That for every k, okay. We can show that the uh, the k intersection uh, chromatic uh, number, right, or the chromatic index, uh, because for edge coloring we use index usually. So the k intersection chromatic index of the graph uh, is uh, at most uh, delta square by k uh, times some constant for delta the maximum degree and k is the parameter that we are looking at. And we can always find graphs which require some other constant times delta square by k. So what we are saying is that if you look at all possible uh, graphs uh, with the maximum degree equal to delta, right? all possible graphs with maximum degree delta, then uh, the maximum over all such graphs, chi k dash of g, is uh, basically uh, uh, theta of uh, delta square by k, which means that uh, theta of delta square by k says that uh, this function, right, uh, this function grows as fast as uh, delta square by k, which is lower bounded by some constant times delta square by k, and upper bounded by some other constant times delta square by k. So in other words, we are saying that whatever uh, k is given and whatever delta is given, right? We can find graphs whose uh, k intersection chromatic uh, index is at least uh, some. Uh, uh, t times delta square by k and it is at most some uh, t star dies, uh, times delta square by k for uh, some two uh, constants t and t star. So we can find the constants t and t star such that for every graph this is less than or equal to t star times delta square by k and it is greater than or equal to some other t times delta square by k. So, <clears throat> so so we need to show these two results, okay? I am going to show the upper bound. Uh, I want you to work out for the lower bound, okay? Uh, which is very easy. So come up with, uh, you know, a graph which requires these many colors and show that uh, it requires some constant times delta square by colors for some other constant. So before uh, looking at this, maybe you should think about how you come up with a random experiment right, etc. and then uh, what kind of events you want to define. But let me proceed. We want to look at uh, the following random experiment. Okay? So we are going to color each edge of the graph uniformly and independently at random using some fixed number C of colors. Okay? So whatever is C we don't know now. We will find out after evaluating all the uh, inequalities and see that when the, uh, for what value of C, all this thing will go through. Right? So this is another way to go ahead. So we define two types of uh, bad events, right? One is the type one event, which corresponds to our first uh, property that we want, right? The coloring to hold. What was the property? The coloring must be proper. Second property was intersection is at most. So for these two, we will define bad events that this does not happen, right? So for a pair uh, of incident edges, E and F, the type one event, right? Let's say E, E, F, event E, F, says that uh, the edges E and F get the same color uh, where the edges are incident with each other. They are adjacent. Okay, E intersection F is non-empty. So for adjacent edges, uh, two of them, uh, E and F, fixed edges E and F, they get the same color. So that is a bad event, right? Because if that happens, our coloring is not proper. So this is a type one event because this type of event, there could be many, right? For any two incident edges, we we can define this event, whether it happens or not. So therefore, for every pair of adjacent 
edges, right? Uh, there is a corresponding event. So type 1 event is many, many in number, depends on the graph. And uh, this is just a type, right? We have EEF is a uh, specific event for fixed edges E and F. For every pair of edges E and F where the intersection is non empty, I can define a type 1 event. So if if uh, if let us say that we can guarantee that you know our coloring is such that this event uh, EEF does not happen for any pair of edges, any pair of edges and edges, then we know that the coloring is going to be a proper coloring, right? And that is precisely what is forbidden, right? Now, then we now define the type 2 event that for some edge, uh, let's say E equal to UV. Uh, and so here we are we are doing a little clever uh, uh, work. Uh, we, will, uh, we will see later maybe. Uh, so you have, you know, the set of edges of uh, incident u, right, that is denoted by e of u, okay. So for, uh, so for, uh, for a set of edges, which is a subset of uh, e of u minus uh, the edge e that we are looking at, right. And for another uh, set, uh, of edges which are edges of v minus the edge e we are looking at so what i am saying is that you have uh, uh, this uv which is the edge e right and then i am looking at some subset s1 of these edges right this is s1 and some subset s2 of these edges which is s2 right uh, of course that does not input e where the cardinality of S1 and cardinality of S2 is actually equal to K. So whatever this is, there are K edges here and K edges here. The event, uh, the bad event, E, uh, E comma S1 comma S2 says that the edges in S1 and the edges in S2 are all colored with the same set of k colors okay so there are k edges here they are colored properly with uh, a set of k colors right so basically the color c1 c2 star ck or for some whatever color c1 to ck uh, that set of colors appears here and the same uh, set of colors appear for this edges also right so this this can happen right in in a random coloring this can happen so for uh, uh, you know, uh, two subsets of size k, this happens. This is a type 2 uh, event. Why is this a bad event? Because if I have k edges of, uh, you know, of k colors here, and the same set of k colors appears here, then together with the, then together with, uh, together with the set of, uh, you know, together with the uh, the color of the edge E, right? Because so E, uh, you can notice that E is not part of the event that we define, right? E is the edge on which we are defining and based on which we are defining the events, but E is not part of the event. So we are saying that S1 uh, is a set of edges which is not uh, containing E. S2 is also not containing E, right? And S1 and S2 has K edges. All these K edges dif uh, see different K colors. And here the same set of k colors appear in some other order. Then what we are saying is that there is k already in common to u and v, including the color of e, we have more than k in common. Okay. Now if this happens, of course, it is bad for us, right? So therefore, a bad event, uh, type 2 event, is that uh, you have uh, uh, k edges here and here getting the same color. Now suppose this does not happen, right? Then we know that our coloring is good because if we have a bad coloring, right? If coloring is bad for some uh, adjacent vertices, we should have uh, some, uh, you know, K plus one colors in common or more, right? So if you have K plus one or more colors in common, then of course, you know, E is the common uh, color for, you know, uh, both anyway. And then, I mean, uh, the color of E is a common color. And then, if there is a k plus 1 in common, then we should be able to find a subset of edges which uses the common colors. And here also you should be able to find a subset of uh, k edges which uses the common colors. So therefore, if 
the coloring becomes bad, I should be able to find such an event. And if I cannot find such an event, the coloring would be a good color. So if I don't have type 1 and type 2 events, right, in the random experiment, if that happens, then I know that I have a k-intersection coloring of the graph using that many colors, right. So therefore, my idea is to now show that for some uh, C, this will happen and C will be of the type that we displayed. <coughs> okay, so the, our idea is to prove that type 1 event and type 2 event does not happen. Now, <coughs> first observation, okay. Suppose E and F are adjacent edges for a type 1 event, then probability of E, E, F is actually 1 over C, right? What does it say? That probability that two adjacent edges, fixed pair of adjacent edges get the same color, right? Is 1 over C. So that is clear because E can be colored with any of the 1 over C colors, I mean any of the C colors, right? 1, 2, etc. C. F can be colored with any of the C colors, right? 1, 2, etc. C. E and F can be colored with any pair of these colors, which is C square colors. And uh, if, you know, what is the set of possible common, you know, like when they are the same, it should be either 1, 1, 2, 2, etc. C, C, therefore there are C possibilities. So C over C square, which is 1 over C. Or you can say that if you fix one color for E, probability that F gets the same color is just 1 over C, right? Because this is already fixed. Now what happens? So this is like, you know, what color it gets. I mean, the probability that it gets precisely the same color is 1 over C. So whichever way you want, look at probability of the bad event E, E, F is 1 over C for a fixed pair of edges E and F. Okay. Similarly, what is the probability of type 2 event? Okay. So if you want to look at the probability of type 2 event, what is the probability? So for an event of type 2, probability of E, uh, e S1, S2 is actually equal to C choose K, K factorial whole square by C ratio to K. That is my claim. So why is this? Well, <coughs> how does such an event happen? Again, we want to look at the colorings. So we have uh, this event defined as follows. So we have the edge E. We have a subset S1 of K edges here, a subset S2 of K edges, right? Now, if an event of this type must happen, okay, every edge I am coloring uniformly and independently at random with one of the C colors, right? So, with probability 1 over C, right, each one is given a fixed color that we know, right? Now, <clears throat> if a set of K colors appears here and the same set of K colors appears here, it can only happen if I choose some set of K colors from the available C colors. Right? So I can choose that in C choose K many ways, okay? in of all the possible colorings. For some C choose K possible fixed set of colors, that color appears here and also here, right? But now, what do I say that? How do I say that? Like, so there are K edges here. This fixed set of K colors I can choose in C choose K possibilities. But once you fix a set of uh, such K colors, it does not matter which order these edges are colored with this K colors. So I have K factorial uh, ways, K factorial ways to give, uh, you know, the same set of K colors to this K edges here. Similarly, independently, I can give uh, you know, the K colors to this K edges also in K factorial ways. Does not matter which order I give here and uh, depending on what happens here, right? So it, it's independent. So I can again multiply right, by the product rule. I know that I can choose in K, uh, C choose K many ways. Then I can distribute them in K factorial whole square many possible ways. And each of these happenings will be bad for us, right? So once you fix S1 and S2, this is precisely the number of ways this can go wrong, right? This can happen. Now total number of colorings of these edges. So there are K edges here and K edges here. So therefore 
2 k edges in common so therefore c raised to 2 k possible colorings are there so therefore uh, the total number of uh, you know uh, favorable uh, events by the number of uh, this thing is c choose k into k factor of square by c raised to 2 k so this is precisely the probability this but you know usually it is very difficult to work with these kind of numbers in the in the you know, working here so i am going to convert it and put a upper bound for the probability i can always work with upper bounds because uh, you know we are we are going to use probability of this is less than or equal to something so if i can if i can show that uh, you know some upper bound itself is less than or equal to it doesn't matter so therefore we have uh, an upper bound here which i can be uh, approximated by k factorial by c raised k so you can you can verify that uh, this inequality is true now <coughs> so we got probabilities for type 1 events and type 2 events right so now what we want now we want to find out the dependencies now here is uh, the trouble usually that we have okay. how do you find a dependency for event because unless we know the structure of the graph it will be very difficult to uh, to put an exact number of events on which uh, all these things happen so usually the trick that we do is the following okay. suppose i want to show right that uh, you know uh, some uh, events are dependent or independent I, I look at the following way. So in this case, for example, I am looking at edge color. Now, when are these two colorings going to uh, depend on the coloring of other uh, uh, edges or, or when, when are two events dependent, right? Only if the event share some edge, right? If they don't share an edge, it does not matter because we are looking at either proper intersection or the, uh, or the, or the intersection is at most this or this thing. So if two events are you know separated, right? Like they don't share any edge. What happens here and what happens here is uh, is uh, immediate. Right? What happens to the events? So therefore, if we can show that events are independent, uh, if uh, they don't share an edge, then we can use a trick to get an upper bound on the maximum number of events on which. Uh, you know, some other event can be influenced uh, influenced by. How do you do that? What I do is the following. I, I, I take one fixed edge, okay? So I pick a fixed edge and say that how many events of a particular type can be part of, I mean, you know, can this edge be part of? So if so every edge uh, can be part of uh, you know at most some number of events right you cannot cannot be part of every event because we are defining all these events in a local neighborhood right so this is why the local uh, lemma usually helps so uh, when we are saying that okay we have these two edges uh, you know they are at a distance one or distance two right and they are either incident right uh, and we are defining what happens to the colorings of these right so they are basically pretty local now uh, so now, uh, therefore, uh, what I am going to do is say that, okay, an edge uh, can be part of at most, let, let's say, uh, this many number of uh, type 1 events, it can be part of at most this many number of type 2 events. Suppose I get an upper bound for this, right, so an, an edge can be part of at most this many events. Now, suppose I am given, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, even AI and uh, an AJ, right? Now I want to see how many events uh, you know AJ can basically uh, share edges with AI, right? So that they they can be dependent. Okay? So I I already found out that you know like an edge can be part of at most, right? An edge E can be part of at most uh, at most uh, some number of uh, events of uh, you know this type right, which is like it's a events AJ. Now if AI has at most let's say k edges, right? So I mean uh, not k. Let's let us use some other number. Let's say uh, p edge, uh, p q q edges, right? 
Suppose even AI has Q edges. AI has Q edges. Now one edge of AI can be part of at most, let us say, uh, you at most uh, some number I want uh, at most. Uh, let's say it is. Mm. Yeah, R, let's say R, right? So if, if an edge can be part of at most R events, right? And uh, an event AI can contain at most Q edges, then AI cannot be intersecting its edges with more than Q times R events of any type, right? This is clear because, you know, one edge cannot be part of more than this many. It has only at most Q edges. So Q times R is definitely an upper bound on the number of events that uh, AI can be dependent on, right? So because of this, uh, you know, th uh, this uh, makes it pretty easy to come up with some bounds. Okay? This bounds may not be very good, but it will help you to uh, get the work done. Right? I mean, of course, if you can do more uh, intense analysis, right, more uh, careful analysis, you should be able to prove better bounds. Most of the time, it becomes very difficult. So we will we will work with what we can. <coughs> so for that, we are going to do the following. Okay. So we come up with this first lemma. We say that uh, for an edge E, at most two delta minus two events of type one can depend on E, right? And at most two delta into delta minus one choose K into delta minus 2 choose k minus 1 even so type 2 can depend on t. So for each type of event, I am going to put some bound on the maximum number of events and h can be part of. Then as I said, for any event I am looking at, if that event contains, you know, q edges, I multiply by q times, you know, this, then I will get the maximum number of type 1 events. This, uh, uh, even other event uh, with Q edges is depending on, right? Similarly, Q times this will give another bound on the number of type 2 events that is depending on. <coughs> so this is this is the idea. So why is this true? Okay. This is pretty easy to see. If I am, if I am looking at, uh, let's say, an edge, uh, I know, an event of type 1, it is basically two intersecting edges, E and F, right? Now, for a fixed edge G, how many events of this type E can be part of? Well, E can be part of an event only if E is adjacent with an edge of type F, right? So F can be one of these edges or one of these edges, right? This edge is only incident to only these many edges, right? These edges and this edge. And what is the maximum number of edges E is incident to? Well, there is, uh, you know, maximum degree is delta, then this is less than or equal to uh, delta minus 1. This is also less than equal to delta minus 1, right? So that's for 2 delta minus 2 uh, events, right? I mean, uh, edges of type F can be paired with E, right? E intersection F is non-empty. So therefore, uh, we know that at most 2 delta minus 2 events of type 1 can contain the edge E, right? <coughs> can, uh, yeah, so can contain E. This is, uh, this is a better way to say it. Yeah depend on E or can contain E. Now, similarly, uh, at most, 2 delta into delta minus 1 choose K into delta minus 2 choose K minus 1. Even so, type 2 can depend on E. So, can you think of why this number is? How can you, can you come up with this upper bound? Okay. So, let me uh, let me go ahead, but you should think about this before going to the next page. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, to prove this, we are going to do the following observation, right? Suppose I am looking at an edge E, which is part of event of type 2. So, what is a type 2 event? A type 2 event is uh, basically saying that a set of edges S1 and S2, right, are chosen. And one of, you know, these edges are colored with colors, uh, you know, like some, some K set of colors here and here, right. 
so the coloring of the edges right uh, i mean forget about the coloring right so the uh, the the edges in uh, which are part of the event are precisely the edges of s1 and s2 if you look at the edge e you know e is not part of the even e uh, subscript uh, small e comma s1 comma s2 why because i i carefully define the event by saying that s1 and s2 are subsets of e of u minus e and e of v minus e right so therefore this central edge is never part of the event so when i say that an edge is part of type 2 event it is one of the edges of s1 or s2 that we are talking about right so <clears throat> when i am uh, looking at this dependency again you know an edge is part of uh, the event precisely when it is not the central edge but it is one of the edges here so to define the event of type 2 right i want to first define a central edge right so given an edge e okay so suppose you are given an edge e you want to define uh, uh, that a type 2 event uh, so for the, therefore you need to come up with a central edge on which the event is defined so if e is part of the edge i have to define a central edge let's say e star okay so i'm going to define a central edge e star how many ways i can choose e star well e star must be of course incident with e right that's how we define the s1 and s2 which is with respect to the e star right so therefore it can be any of this 2 delta minus 2 edges right 2 delta minus 2 edges at most this many right those can be chosen one of these can be chosen as a central edge right let me let me choose this one right this is a central edge so i can choose in 2 delta minus 2 ways i can choose my central edge e star now once i choose e star i need to choose the remaining edges of the event what are the remaining edges of event right e star is not part of the event but i fix the edge e star i choose uh, you know the the structure in which you know this is going to happen right so 2 delta minus 2 possibilities i choose e star once i choose e star i need to select remaining k minus 1 edges here because i already have one at e so i need to choose a subset s1 of size actually equal to k right so i need to choose k minus 1 more edges to be part of this set in which e is belonging so how many ways i can do this well at most delta so this edge is not part of the uh, event this edge is already included so i have at most delta minus 2 possible remaining edges out of which i need to choose k minus 1 of them, right so delta minus 2 choose k minus 1 possible uh, edges uh, i mean possible ways i can i can choose this subset then i need to choose a k element subset on this side but that is delta minus 1 edges except the edge e star right i have at most delta minus 1 and out of which i need to choose k right this i can choose independently so once i choose e star i can choose k minus 1 edges and then i can choose delta minus 1 choose k edges to define the type 2 event so therefore i have so the, these are all you know by product rule 2 delta minus 2 into delta minus 2 choose k minus 1 into delta minus 1 choose k right uh, which is uh, upper bounded by 2 delta because you know, minus 2 i don't want to work with uh, minus 2 which is makes more humbus to work with. but of course minus 2 will help to improve the bounds part so this is uh, at most 2 delta into delta minus 1 choose k into delta minus 2 choose k minus 2. Right? that many events of type 2 can contain the edge now <coughs> this again uh, to make you know working with uh, you know this kind of uh, you know uh, binomial coefficients are difficult so i will convert it into this form right? this is at most 2 into uh, delta raised to 2k by k factorial to k minus 1 factorial okay so this again you know something you can you can uh, work out the details <coughs> now suppose so so i have i have proved this lemma now right so i have you know for every edge it can contain it can be part of at most 2 delta minus 2 events of type 1 and 2 delta into this many events of type uh, 2 <coughs> okay 
Now to apply lower like lower local lemma, we need to find the constants, right? Associated with each one. Now, as I told you, coming up with the constants is a uh, you know, part of trial and error with some experience, you will get some nice number. Since we know that probability of uh, AI for the type 1 event, right? Uh, probability of uh, EEF is 1 over C. We know that our uh, constant X, right? Constants X in the lower local lemma. Where is the lowest local lemma? Yeah. Uh, constants X i must be upper bound for the probabilities because I want to show that probability of A is less than or equal to X i times something. So I want something larger than 1 over C, right? To be my constant. So what is the constant that I am going to choose? I am going to choose 2 over C for the time being. So I put X equal to 2 over C is a constant associated with an event of type 1. Okay. Don't think of this as just a one number. You know, this is basically for each event of type 1. There are hundreds of them, it would be. Uh, you are associating a constant, right? In in But here I am putting all of them to be universally the same number, right? 2 over C. Then you have the type 2 events for the probability of that is k factorial by c raised to k, right? Upper bounded by that. So therefore, I want an even larger number to be my constant associated with that. So that is going to be k factorial 2 raised to k by c raised to k. Again, just to make sure that, you know, the uh, inequalities work out very nicely. And in fact, it will come to the same uh, format if you want to uh, see later. So I know, so I have now uh, everything I need, right? I have the constants, I have the probabilities, and I have the uh, dependencies, right? Now dependency, we have to be a little more careful. We will see. Now we want to apply the uh, lowest local lemma. How do you do that? So probability of uh, type uh, even whatever type one even uh, probability of AI, which is one over C, is less than or equal to the constant two over C into Product over all the dependent events, right? We want to find out one minus uh, the corresponding constant, right? So we know that if I look at a type, so I am currently looking at the type one event, right? A type one event contains type one event contains like you no know, E E F contains exactly two edges, right? E and F. For one edge, I said that it depends on at most. 2 delta other event, right? 2 delta minus 2, again upper bounded by 2 delta, right? For one particular edge, it can be part of at most 2 delta event. So for the entire event, I have only two edges, so it can be part of at most 2 into 2 delta events of type. Now for type 1 event, right? So I am looking at uh, the product 1 minus xj for, uh, you know, like aj in di, right? So, for, for, for this type 1 event, right, type 1 event intersecting with other type 1 events, right, I am saying that at most uh, 2 into 2 delta, sorry, 2 into 2 delta uh, events of type 1 can be part of, I mean, can be intersecting with one of the, one of the fixed events, right. So, therefore, in this product, I have at most, 2 into 2 delta, 4 delta times in this first part, right? So therefore, I get that, okay, the first part, 1 minus 2 over C corresponding constant xj, right, uh, raised to 2 into 2 delta. Now, what happens with the type 1 event intersecting type 2 event, right? So, type 2 event associated variable, right, xj is k factorial 2 raised to k by c raised to k, right? that's my y, right? So, 1 minus this, whole raised to, again, two edges in this, one edge can be part of at most two delta square and delta raised to 2k by k factorial into k minus one factorial. So therefore, two times that many uh, 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 events can be part of both of these, I mean, can be containing one of these edges, right? So therefore, uh, I get uh, this inequality, one over c less than or equal to, uh, sorry, 1 over c is less than or equal to 2 over c into 1 minus 2 over c whole raised to 4 delta and uh, 1 minus k factorial 2 raised to k by c raised to k whole raised to 4 delta raised to 2k by 
k factorial to k minus 1 factorial. Okay. So, this is the first inequality. For the, so, I mean, this is not a single inequality, okay. Mind you that this is basically uh, for every pair of incident edges, you have an inequality of this way. So, we are basically writing all the inequalities in the same form because they all can be put into this upper bounded uh, form, right. So, therefore, all these are representing different events. There are many of them uh, in the same uh, uh, inequality. So, for the type 2 event now, I am defining, right. So, for a fixed type 2 event, probability is k factorial by c raised to k, upper bounded by that number, right. k factorial by c raised to k. Now, again, it is less than or equal to corresponding constant right, which is k factorial 2 raised to k uh, by c raised to k into 1 minus 2 over c, the 1 minus uh, xj, right, which for the type 2 event intersecting type 1 event, right. Now, type 2 event has k, uh, no, k plus k, two k edges, right, s1 and s2, both has k edges. So, and one edge can be part of at most two delta events of type uh, type 1. So, therefore, it is 2k into 2 delta, 4k delta. And then, similarly, 1 minus k factorial is uh, 2 raised k by 0 raised k whole raised to, again, 2k edges in the uh, event. So, 2k into the uh, bound for 1 edge can be part of at most many, right? So, therefore, uh, 2k into 2 delta raised to uh, 2k by this one. Now, if you look at these two, inequalities so the the choice of the constants made sure that you no know, they are basically following from the same thing right so for example i can i can cut out uh, k factorial on both sides i can uh, uh, remove i mean I, I can take the kth root right right here i have 1 over c raised k 1 over c raised k etc right uh, and 2 raised k and here all i have powers of k so if i take the kth root this inequality is exactly equal to this equal inequality. This may not happen all, all cases. Here our choice of constant made sure it happens the same way. So basically this inequality follows from proving this inequality which is 1 less than or equal to 2 into right cancelling out all this c also 2 into 1 minus 2 raised to 4 delta into 1 minus k factorial 2 raised k by 3 raised k whole raised to 4 delta raised to 2k by k factorial to k minus 1 factorial. Now Again, see, see, after this, it is just routine calculation and see for what value of C this works out. But let me go a little more in detail. So, I am going to try out the numbers to see which works. Finally, I found out that C equal to, let us say, 22 delta square by K works in this case. We can, we can do some refinement to make it smaller, but that is, let us be uh, easy. So, let us say that C is equal to 22 delta square by K. Okay. Then, the same inequality, right, after substituting for c by 22 delta square by k, I will get something like this, 1 less than or equal to 2 into 1 minus k by 11 delta square, whole dash 4 delta, etc. Et okay. So, once I, once I get this inequality, here is some, you know, trick that often comes in handy while working with lower local lemma. Okay. <coughs> so, there is this identity. Uh, Identity 1 minus, uh, I have written it here maybe, right? 1 minus 1 by z, whole edge z is greater than or equal to 1 by 4, for z at least uh, 2, okay? So, this is something we can verify, like this function increases and uh, uh, basically converges to uh, 1 over e. Uh, and uh, we will see that this is greater than or equal to 1 by 4 for z at least 2, okay? So, many times the idea is to so to show such an inequality the idea is to somehow uh, you know or rewrite the numbers into a form which comes uh, resembles this which will give uh, a nice upper bound uh, for uh, you know a nice lower bound uh, here and then try to use that uh, try to use that here to say that since that number is at least this uh, this inequality uh, will hold true right so, for that, we, we do some manipulations here, okay. I have written down the manipulations, but, uh, you know, you can read these details. I don't want to uh, make it very uh, difficult to follow. Just pause the video, look through the working details and see that, like, you know, we can define, uh, you know, this by, you know, writing this uh, bracket within whatever is in brackets, right, beta 1 uh, as this one, beta 2 as this. 
so that uh, you will get uh, it into this form 1 less than or equal to 2 into beta 1 raised to uh, 4k by 11 delta and uh, beta 2 raised to this thing and once this uh, obtained we can see that and the sum of the exponents of beta 1 and beta 2 uh, together right this 11 delta square by k and this one uh, no 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 uh, 4k by uh, 11 delta and 4 by k minus 1 factorial into k by 11 whole raised uh, k they sum to some number which is less than or equal to half now because of this right beta 1 and beta 2 are greater than or equal to 1 by 4 uh, we can apply this uh, uh, identity right so this 1 by 4 whole raised to something uh, greater than or equal to 1 by 4 whole raised to something less than or equal to 1 by 2 so therefore that number is going to be uh, less than uh, 1 by 2 here and so i will get something uh, which is greater than or equal to 1 so therefore the inequality will hold so this will hold if if you assume delta is at least 6 and uh, k is less than or equal to delta i mean this is i mean you don't have to assume because you cannot have more than k as the intersection and uh, more than delta as the intersection and delta can be assumed to be at most 6 because when we say delta is equal to 5 okay this and we have this big number 22 right 22 delta square by k that 22 will swallow all the other uh, you know uh, constants and then uh, uh, when when delta is equal to 5 or less uh, we will see that uh, you know uh, you can find a direct coloring right by just giving all the edges at distance distance 2 to be different colors it is possible and therefore uh, you know the result really follows so we can assume delta is at least 6 and uh, assuming this we will we will see that the inequality holds therefore by lower slocal lemma uh, none of these events type 1 or type 2 even happen uh, happen together right uh, i mean not that like they don't happen together uh, the complements of these events happen together with positive probability right? so none of the events happen with positive probability so that is precisely uh, you know, uh, the, the proof and the result follows. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, so we proved uh, uh, this result. So lower local lemma, as you can see, uh, can be a little uh, bit work to work to apply, right? Uh, but uh, it is very very powerful, and you will see that uh, in many many uh, papers, you know. Uh, people come up with uh, proof using lower local lemma and uh, uh, it is a fairly fairly easy tool to apply in the sense that you know, conceptually it's very easy only that working uh, details and you know finding the constants is the only cumbersome part so uh, this is a very nice tool uh, we will uh, uh, give you one example uh, i mean uh, as a homework question uh, to finish this lecture. Okay. So let D be a directed graph and uh, mu is a minimum uh, in degree and uh, delta is the minimum of degree uh, of the vertices of the graph. Now suppose E times delta mu plus 1 okay, into 1 minus 1 by k whole raised to delta is less than or equal to 1. right? For uh, k greater than 0, D has a directed cycle whose length is a multiple of k. Okay. So you want to show that the directed graph D has a directed cycle whose length is a multiple of k if this condition uh, holds true, right? That uh, E into delta mu plus 1 into 1 minus delta, uh, 1 minus 1 by k whole raised to small delta is less than or equal to 1 for k greater than 0. So now, <coughs> uh, this is a homework and uh, one can, you know, like if you if you are familiar with it, it's immediately clear why what is to be done because you have e, you have uh, uh, p into d plus one, right? That formula, right? Less than or equal to one, and you can see what is going to be your uh, d, what is your going to be p, etc. Right? E p d plus. One. So then you define a corresponding random experiment where the probabilities and dependencies corresponding to this, and uh, you should be through. But then you need to basically figure out how to come up with the random experiment what is the experiment that you are thinking about so that is it so with that uh, we wind up our uh, excursion to uh, probabilistic method okay so very very small introduction and uh, we will we will uh, stop with this and then we will continue with the other topics uh, in the next class okay so thank you very much